In 1964, Marshall McLuhan wrote an important and difficult book called Understanding Media, which is largely about his phrase, the medium is the message. The phrase is very important, uh, and it says something that we sort of take for granted now, but didn't back then, because back then we were arguing over the content of the media, what the newspapers were saying and how bad television was and the like. And McLuhan said, sure, fine, but we should also be paying attention to the nature of the media themselves, because they're very different and have different effects on us and how we think about ourselves. Uh, newspapers and books are very linear, line after line, page after page. Television and movies slice up time and place. They have they use cuts to jam things together, which gives us a different idea about how the world works. And so we need to be paying much more attention to the nature of the media um, themselves, he says. And McLuhan wasn't always the clearest and most precise of thinkers and writers. Um, and so <laughs> in the course of trying to explain uh, medium is the message, right at the beginning of the book, he takes as an example a light bulb. Now, a light bulb is the sort of thing you might point to if you're looking for an example of something that is absolutely not a medium. It's a light bulb. And he says it's a medium that has no content, so it's sort of a special sort of medium, but it's a medium. It's a medium, he says, because it lights up a place, it carves a hole in, in, in the darkness, and it enables certain types of interactions to occur. And thus, it is, it is a medium. Um, we're going to come back to that because it, it may seem that he was just trying to stretch his concept far enough that it would embrace everything and become even more important. But there may be more to it than that. The phrase, the medium is the message, is actually a reference back to the work of Claude Shannon, who in 1948 wrote a important and very difficult paper called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. It's mainly math. It's really hard. I can't read the math. But even if you thumb through it without math, you'll come across a diagram that you will immediately recognize. It's a very simple diagram. It's a box with a thin wire going to another box. And you look at that and you say, oh, oh, that's communication, which is exactly what it is uh, in the context of the book. Um, the communication, so it's one person on the left who has an idea, or since, since, since Shannon is generalizing this, there's some information. We're going to try to get that information into the other box, which is usually for humans, it's another human being. Um, and the wire is the medium. And Shannon's question was how much information can be squeezed through a particular medium. But that, that diagram is so obvious to us because it's one that we've been trained on. I mean, so in human terms, a human has an idea. Now, ideas are mental things, right? They don't have any weight. Our minds don't weigh anything. Our, our brains do, but our minds don't because it, they are immaterial, or so we have thought. Um, and so we first have the problem of how do we translate this idea into something that can go through a physical medium? Um, and um, Shannon's diagram shows a, uh, just, it gets encoded and it goes through the medium, and at the other side, the other person uh, decodes it and now has the same idea. But it's not exactly the same idea because f for, I mean, the idea of a medium is that a medium cannot make a message better. It can only make a message worse because there can be static and interference and can you hear me now and all of that. It cannot make a message better. It can only degrade it. And so, what you have is a person with an idea here and then a person with pretty much the same idea here. Good enough, uh, close enough. Um, this is such a familiar diagram, this box, line, box, because in the West, Western philosophy has given us I this idea of communication. Western philosophy is basically a long line of lonely white guys. And uh, in this diagram, Communication, very familiar diagram. The uh, communication is an achievement. It's an accomplishment because you have two people who are locked inside their minds what, and they're trying to get ideas across this thin wire. And if you achieve it, that's amazing. It's communication starts out in the West. We think of it as a problem to be overcome. The picture that emerges, box, line, box, 
is basically a picture of two people in adjoining cells. And one has an idea, and they knock in prisoner code on the wall, and the other person in the other cell hears it, interprets it, uh, you know, decodes it, and now has the same idea, or roughly the same idea. These ideas are, you've, you're now making copies of ideas. There's never any actual connection. Rather, it's the reproduction of an, one idea in another person's mind. And it's an incredibly lonely and dismal picture, not just of communication, but of being a human. Well, in 1980, McLuhan died, which means that he never got to see the internet as we know it, which is really, really a shame because, for one thing, he would have had so much to say about it because the internet is a medium. In fact, it's a series of, of media. And at the bottom, there are the media that are the wires, and the cables, the radio signals, and all the rest, a very, very Shannon-like type of medium. That wouldn't do us any good if we didn't have software programs, applications, apps, platforms that enable us to use all of these wires. And those, each of those applications or platforms is itself a medium and is subject to a McLuhan-like analysis of media. So rather than simply looking at the content of tweets or contents of Facebook posts or whatever, we can, we can ask, okay, uh, that's important to know about, but also how, does, how do these media, how does Twitter shape not only the content, but the ways in which we connect with one another. So content, sure, Twitter's 280 characters, very direct effect, but there's also how easy it, is it to embed a link and what are the uh, things that it has that enable us to, to connect with, with others. We can, we can uh, retweet something out to people who follow us. We can put in uh, at somebody, we can, we can tag things, we can use hashtags and the like. And that's all very different from Facebook, that's what make these, makes these different. And so we can do a McLuhan-like analysis of each of these, and many people do, and they're very, very useful and helpful, to understand not just the content, but how those media are shaping us and shaping our connections to others. So you have the wires, you have the platforms and apps, but you still have nothing. Nothing's happening unless there's a third layer of media, which, are, which is us. We are the media of the internet, and I mean that literally. We are the ones who move messages along. Those messages move through us in all the different ways in which we do it on the internet. Um, this is sort of amazing. It's a very different idea of medium, um, and even though I think it still is, absolutely, we are the media of the net, but it's different in at least two ways from classical sorts of media. The first is in classical media, uh, the medium can't improve anything, can only make it worse. Every change is a degradation, but that's not the case on the internet where we, when we pass things along, we routinely change them. We, if I retweet something, I may put in a comment which contextualizes the tweet, which changes it. It changes how you, how you perceive it. Uh, that's not necessarily a degradation. The internet is all about us passing along messages and our fingerprints are on them and we are discussing and changing and contextualizing. And even if I don't write a comment, I just retweet it out to the people who follow me, it's still marked as coming from me and that itself is a type of, of comment, a type of metadata that changes the content. So that's the, the first difference from traditional media. The second is that the box line box view of media and of communication um, doesn't work to describe this because I am tweeting things along, I'm retweeting things along, which means I am the recipient and I am also the medium through which it passes. And so that box line box is way too simple, but it's actually not, way, way, way too simple. Because frequently what we are doing when we are moving messages along are we are moving messages along that we've encountered and we are moving them through and we are, we are amplifying them or we're disagreeing with them or making fun of them or whatever. And so we are, we are the recipient, we are the sender, and we are the medium, the wire. And so this box is incredibly unhelpful. It's a simplifying way of simplifying and understanding the internet. It gets everything about the internet wrong, everything that matters about the internet wrong. In fact, I think this is a place where McLuhan's idea of the light bulb as a medium actually makes a lot of sense because the internet as a medium is like a light bulb. It, it creates a space, it clears a space. It clears a space that has particular characteristics, however. 
Um, and I'm going to point to, so we could do a McLuhan-like analysis of the internet as a whole. I just want to point to three really obvious things. There's obviously tons and tons of things to say about this. Um, so the first is that, yeah, what, what's peculiar, distinctive about the place that the internet clears? Well, it's a shared place. Of course it is. I mean, that's why we're there. Second of all, it, it, it's not made out of bricks or mortar or mountains and grass. It's made out of, it's made out of meaning. Everything that's on the internet, almost everything, was placed there by somebody because it meant something to them. And all of the commentary and all of the, the building up of meaning around that is also because it means things to people. So that's the second characteristic. And the third is the internet is a place in which we discover what matters to us. Now, we sometimes talk about this in ter terms of interests, which is fine, but I'm going to stick with matters for the moment. We discover things that matter, and we pursue them. And it's often it's surprising what, to us what we're pursuing. Um, but we also, because it's a shared place, we also see that the world of the internet matters to other people as well. It just matters differently. Two of us are commenting on the same post or whatever, and we're saying different things. I mean, it's just that simple. It's a shared place of meaning that m shows itself as mattering to us and mattering to others, except mattering differently. Now, if we were to start our analysis of communication, not by taking uh, you know, two prisoners in a cell or people who are having trouble communicating in a storm or from mountaintop to mountaintop or whatever, if we took the internet out as our example of communication, we would never come up with box, line, box. That would, it doesn't capture anything that matters about the internet as a form of communication. Instead, we would end up with something that is far more complex, that includes the fact of meaning and of sharing a world. We would not have the idea that communication consists of isolated people struggling to connect. We'd start off with the connection, with the place in which we are together with one another, exploring what matters and making meaning together. That seems to me to be a far better and truer way of beginning to think about communication the one that's then one that strips it down to two lonely people shouting across uh, a distance or knocking on their cell walls